if you're here today, we are picking up in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the beauty and power of your word. Lord, we thank you that um, as we look at the stories today, we can see examples to avoid, examples to follow, and we see the, the high priest and his faithfulness and how he lived a long, rich life, and people knew that he was honorable um, Jehoiada the priest and Lord we look at how Jesus you're our high priest and how you ever live to make intercession for us you you take up uh, notice of what we're going through and you, you care about us so deeply so Lord we ask that you would speak in power this morning in Jesus name as we open your word amen so if you're with us in second chronicles if you remember first chronicles 17 we recall David was given a covenant a promise and that promise was that he would always have someone to be seated on the throne. And uh, later we'll read that there's a Jeconiah, or one that comes about that um, brings a curse on the line of David. But as we look at Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was a good king. And why was that? Because he was proactive to tear down altars. He was proactive to, to get rid of Baal worship and worship of false gods. And not only that, he feared God and he listened to the prophets that were true. Whereas Ahab, his, I don't know if you want to call him counterpart in the north, Ahab wouldn't even listen if a true prophet told him the truth. Like, he wouldn't listen and obey. He knew the true prophets were telling him the truth, but Ahab was so wicked, he knew the truth and he did not obey. So that made his judgment all the worse. And his wife Jezebel, and we're going to kind of see some of the consequences of that coming down the line. And what is good about Jehoshaphat is he wanted to have a alliance because he wanted unity, but the problem is you cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers, and the problem with Ahab is he was bent on wickedness, and Jehoshaphat feared the Lord God, and if two aren't moving in the same direction, you can't travel together. You just can't. I don't know if you've tried that before. It doesn't work. And Jehoshaphat rested, we have verse 1 of chapter 21, with his fathers. He was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers and sons, the sons of Jehoshaphat. Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, and it's like a, a different spelling of it, but Azariah, Yahu, and Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were sons of Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel. So they said that he had several sons, some of the two of them had very similar names. Now the father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with the fortified cities in Judah. But he gave them the kingdom, uh, he gave the kingdom to his oldest son, Jehoram, who was his firstborn. So notice he has, what did we count here? One, two, three, four, five. He has six children, but he gave his kingdom to another, to his oldest child. But let me rewind to verse 1 one more time. When Joshua died, they buried him in the city of David, which is still there today. Jehoram reigned in his place. There were six other brothers. Why is this important? Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold, but they, that didn't matter because verse 4, when Jehoram, or Joram, was established over the kingdom of his father. He strengthened himself and he killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. When you have a lot, a lot of kids, like we've been blessed to have some kids, and they'll be like, I, my brother hates me, my brother doesn't like me. In this case, the brother did hate his brothers. He killed them all, literally murdered them all. Why is that significant? Pretty cutthroat, pretty, pretty intense. But the same thing happens today. In many kingdoms, they, the firstborn, look at Queen Elizabeth, she was the oldest of the monarchy. Monarchies and powers, they look typically to the firstborn to be the heir. Honestly, that's why there's a division between the Sunnis and the Shiite Muslims. There's a division of who they think the true prophet, or who the imams that came down the line from Muhammad were by birth, and those that were by more their their religion's choice but it's a cause for dissension because in this case uh, 
David had to have a descendant on the throne. And if one of them were to die, or if Jehoram dies, now he's just killed off the rest of his family. Very wicked, very evil, and very vulnerable for the promises of God to be fulfilled. So he kills all his brothers with a sword, and also others of the princes of Israel. He went around the northern region, and he killed people. So Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem, and he walked in the way of the kings of the north, the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay. Go back to Jehoshaphat. He was, he's got a funny name, but he's a, he was a great king. He loves the Lord. And he allowed his son to marry the daughter of very, very wicked King Ahab. Think about that. And this Athaliah woman was a murderous idolater who was evil, evil, evil. So we call, we call certain institutions after dishonorable names. We call things like Jezebel is a, a name that makes you think evil and uh, fornicating and all these uh, idolatrous things. Well, she had a daughter, and this daughter marries Jehoram. Jehoram, just like his father Ahab. Remember Jezebel, for Ahab, he wanted a vineyard, and Jezebel had the owner of the vineyard murdered. We'll read that in 2 Kings, I believe, in chapter 9. There's a pronounced judgment in 2 Kings 9, if you want to read that later. But Ahab, uh, because he was a complainer, because he did not truly fear God, he allowed his wife to murder an innocent man. And they worshipped on every high hill and they sacrificed their children. Just atrocious, atrocious evils. Verse 6, and he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Notice, it's very easy to remember how many good kings there were in Israel in the northern kingdom. You know what the answer is? Zero. Not a single one. So he walked in the wicked way because he did not fear the Lord. And it says... He did evil in the sight of the Lord, yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he made with David. And since he had promised to give him a lamp and to his sons forever. I've already said that, but you can find that promise in uh, really 1 Chronicles 17 when God promises David, I will always, I will bring one of your descendants to be the king forever. So there used to be a holy fear. If you remember when Josh, Jehoshaphat was ruling, when David handed over the kingdom to Solomon even, um, there used to be a holy fear where if you look at King Asa and Ahijah, but really Asa during 39 years of his reign, they would not mess with the kingdom of Judah because they knew God's hand was on them. And we talked about that. When you please the Lord, people respect and you will fear the Lord, they'll leave you alone kind of thing. Well, here in the days... In, in his days, Jehoram, he just murdered all these people. He's walking wickedly. Edom, which is the descendants of Esau, Jacob and Esau, two sons of, of Isaac, they revolted against Judah's authority and made a king over themselves. So Edom's like, we're going to have a king. Do you know that Herod and Herod the Great and all his family, they were Edomites and they were the last of the Edomites. There are no Edomites after them. But they made themselves a king. So Jehoram went out with his officers and his chariots with him, and he rose by night and attacked the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots. Thus Edom has been in revolt against Judah, that is his authority, or Judah's authority, until, or against his rule, because he had forsaken, oh sorry, they've been in rebellion to this day. So when Ezra wrote this by the Holy Spirit, he was saying, Edom attacked during the time of Jehoram. Jehoram attacked back, but did not conquer him. So ever since this period in history, Edom was at odds with Israel. Why is that important? Because the king of Edom, that Herod the Great, almost murdered Jesus again. Remember Herod the Great, the Christmas story that we read in Luke? He, there was a census from Ju the Augustus Caesar, right? But when the wise men came in Matthew chapter 2, I believe it is, they came from the east. They came to Herod the Great, and Herod the Great said, Go, when you find the king, go find me and tell me so I can worship him also. But really, he ended up killing all the boys in Bethlehem. Because he'd want, should, if he really wanted to see the king, he could have followed the wise men, but he 
Instead, he murdered some dozens of people, like Jeremiah prophesied. So, the Edomites, bad people, um, wicked, worldly, and they could have been allies. But Jehoram, because of his wickedness, God allowed them to be at odds with the Edomites. Now, the city named Libna, it was a priestly city, it wasn't a nation. We don't know exactly where it is. But at that time, Libna revolted against his rule because he had forsaken the Lord God and his fathers. These are Levites, and they said, if, he's, if our king is not going to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then we're out. We're done. Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah, and he caused the inhabitants of Judah to commit idolatry, and he led Judah astray. Okay? So the high places were like statues. They were places of worship for all sorts of demonic gods. And think about it. Whether we like it or not, when our highest leaders in the land are wicked people, the Proverbs even say, when the wicked rule, the righteous hide themselves. So he's living in a way to worship these false gods, and people knew it. The priests said, we're out of here. Now, you would think that the priests leaving would have got his attention. But... He's leading his whole nation astray. We see here in verse 12. Then he gets a letter from him. Guess who? Right? Elijah the prophet. We have not really read much about Elijah, but he, this king, he sends a letter, or he gets a letter sent from Elijah. And what does it say? This is horrible, but listen. Thus says the Lord God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot, which means to fall in love with false gods, like the harlotry of the house of Ahab, and also have killed your brothers, those of your father's household, who were better than yourself. He, killed, he was so wicked, he killed people that were better than himself. Behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction, your children, your wives, and your possessions, and you will become very sick with the disease of your intestines and until your intestines come out. A reason of sickness day by day. He says, guess what? Elijah, the prophet. Elijah, who was contemporaneous with Ahab. Remember, Elijah was the one who said uh, to him, no rain will fall for three and a half years. And we read this in the book of James, chapter 5. That Elijah was a man just like us, but he prayed and the, the heavens were shut up for three and a half years. Because he was pronouncing judgment upon King Ahab. And I'm sure that King here, Jehoram had heard of that. Then he receives a letter and basically says, because you're worshiping false gods, all the people are chasing after false gods. Your possessions and family are going to be taken away, and you're going to be so sick, sick in your intestines that they're basically going to rot out of your body. You're going to die. If you got a letter like that, would you be like, oh Lord, please have mercy on me. Like, I want to change. I don't want to suffer this, but we read nothing of the sort. Verse 16, Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house. Notice they plundered his house. And also his sons and his wives so that there, were not, there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. So Jehoram, they stole all of his wives, all but one of his sons, all of his possessions. Okay, so now he's going to repent, right? No. After all this, the Lord struck him in his in intestines with an incurable disease. I don't know if you've heard of ulcerative colitis. I don't know if you've heard of ulcers. I don't know if you've heard of Crohn's disease. I don't know if you've heard of um, irritable bowel syndrome and all these things, right? But imagine all that times terminal. Right? He's going to die from this. Incurable disease. Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, that his intestines came out because of his sickness. How gross. So he died in severe pain, and his people made no burning for him, like the burning of his fathers, for his fathers. So Asa, Jehoshaphat, honorable king, Jehoram, he just worshipped false gods. He killed his brothers who were more honorable than him. He wouldn't turn. He wouldn't repent. He would not uh, trust in the Lord. And what happens? 
he dies one of the most despicable deaths of medical proportions. If you've ever had a hernia, imagine your intestines coming out of your body. That's there's probably some sort of like that, something like that. And but it's the whole intestines, all of them. So. Ugh. So what's the moral of the story there? Jeho uh, Jehoram, he did not fear the Lord. He dishonored God. And we too need to learn from his wicked example and say, I want to be tender. If the Lord's disciplining me, I don't want to worship false gods. I don't want to be a distraction or a deterrent for other people to come to the Lord. And if I, if I hear the word of the Lord, I need to heed it, listen to it. Then it happened in the course of time, after the end of two years, his intestines came out because of his sickness, so he died of severe pain. People made no burning for him. They didn't celebrate his death in the sense of commemorating him. He was dishonored. And he was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem for eight years. To no one's sorrow he departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Now, he was a king, but they didn't bury him with the king. It's interesting because we'll see later with the high priest what happens. Jehoiada. So chapter 22. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his place. For the raiders who came with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. No. So Jehoram dishonored the Lord, killed all his siblings, so his house was raided, all his family was taken, all his sons were killed except one, and now this Ahaziah becomes king, and he reigns. Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year at Jerusalem. His mother's name, this is very important, was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, so the daughter of Ahab. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. So once again, remember, Jehoshaphat mended with the northern kings, but at a great, great cost. Because Jehoshaphat married his son into the family of Ahab, we'll see how great this wicked council and this family destroyed, almost destroyed the lineage of David. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, where his mother advised him to do wickedly. Therefore, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab. For they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. So the house of Ahab, um, he went to, it would be basically like us going to a witch or a um, someone who talks to the dead, necromancer. Maybe it would be like us going to a Muslim to get advice on what the Bible has to say. That's pretty much what King was doing here. He's saying... Um, I don't really know the God of my father. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go to Ahab's house because he's my uncle or he's my father-in-law. Ahab was his father-in-law. He's like, hey, I'm going to go because have you ever had an experience, and this is a rhetorical, where wherever your in-laws are is not necessarily where you want them to be. I'm just going to say that. Now, in this case, he knew that Ahab had been killed or born. And he knew that Jezebel was a murderer. And this is his father-in-law and mother-in-law. Okay? This is not just them being kind of whatever, um, relaxed. They were the most wicked and the most powerful in the land. Therefore, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. If you have bad counselors, you're going to do evil on the side of the Lord. If you do not listen to the word of God and you listen to wicked people, you're going to do evil on the side of the Lord. Like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father, to his destruction. If you listen to evil counsel, you'll be destroyed. He also followed their advice, and he went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king. Okay, so there were two Jehorams. How confusing is that? One in the north, one in the south. Right? We have a Levi and an Eli. My brother and I, we have our sons close together. But if we both named our sons Levi, that'd be pretty confusing. Well, in the north they had a Jehoram, and in the south they had a Jehoram. The son of Ahab, the king of Israel, went to war with Hazael, the king of Syria, and Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram, or Jehoram. 
Then he returned to Jezreel to recover from his wounds, which he had received at Ramah. So in Syria, once again, Syria, Damascus is the oldest city in the world, if you did not know. And it will be a heap of ruins in the last days. But the Syrians were here in the midst, in the midst of this story. They wounded Joram. He returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds. And when he fought against Hazael, the king of Syria, and Azariah, the king, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, because he was sick. So just like Jehoshaphat before went to Ahab, now you've got their sons hanging out with each other. Grandson hanging out with uh, another grandson. His going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. Now God is sitting on the throne. There's a song we just sang last night that says God is on the throne. He reigns forevermore. Just think about it. Just think about it, which is really the word Selah, right? But the, the bridge is pretty awesome. It's like, hallelujah, he reigns, hallelujah, he saves, hallelujah, always, he's never going to let you down. We think about this song, right here, God is on the throne. God is on the throne, he reigns forevermore, just think about it. When you're not walking with the Lord, you're taking evil counsel, you don't realize he's on the throne, he sees everything, he knows everything. Nothing surprises God because he's on the throne. And he knew that when this Ahaziah was going to visit Joram, that it would be for his downfall. You're singing a happy song about something really sad. Well, I'm glad to know that even the evil, God is on the throne. Even the good, God is on the throne. Even what's going on around the world that I don't even know about, God is on the throne. So that's the principle here. So he's going to Joram. Ahaziah is the new king, and his downfall was known by the Lord. When he arrived, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu. Now, the author here is assuming that we know the story, but the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord has anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. Okay, Jehu was a general in the northern kingdom of Israel. In 2 Kings 9, if you want to read that, Jehu was a wicked man, but guess what? He's meeting with his other generals. Imagine we're all a part of an army in the northern kingdom. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. And in walks a prophet. The prophet walks up to Jehu, who will pretend is sitting right here. And he pours oil on your head. And all of us look at Jehu and, and like, what was that about? Because we're not super close to him. But he says, well, he anointed me to be king of Israel. So they throw down their robes and they say, hail, hail King Jehu. And Jehu was God's chosen instrument to destroy the house of Ahab. And he was an evil, very violent man. And he took that command from the anointing and the chosen uh, call of God, the anointing, the oil, the horn of oil was poured on him. He took that mantle and he actually went more zealous than what he had to. He killed all of Ahab's household, but he also came. And we'll see, he takes care of Ahab, Ahaziah in the south. And he almost, once again, almost destroyed the line of David. So it assumes that you understand that there's this zealous man who went above and beyond, killed the, the family they had in the north and even some in the south. But Jehu is this general that God chose, wicked man, to exact judgment on the king of Ahab and Jezebel, at the house of king Ahab and Jezebel. And it happened when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab that he found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brothers who served Ahaziah, and he killed him. So not only did he want to kill Ahab's family, but Ahaziah, his son-in-law, and all of his extended relatives. Then he searched for Ahaziah, and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria, which is a little bit more than we And they brought him to Jehu. When they had killed him, so he's dead, King Ahaziah is dead, they buried him because, they said, he is the son of Jehoshaphat, who sought the Lord with all of his heart. So the house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power over the kingdom. So you're like, oh no, God's word is not true. Now all of David's family is dead. Everyone who's descended from David is dead. Maybe is what you're thinking. Well, now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose, it gets worse here, and she destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Okay. 
this woman, like, we talk about the atrocious, the atrocious things of murder, abortion, and how it's heartbreaking it's, if you've ever had one, you know, there's forgiveness. But in this sense, she's like murdering grown men. This woman is like the wicked witch, murdering men, the wicked queen. But Jehoshaphat, or Jehoshaphat, the daughter of the king, Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in the bedroom. So Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest. Now that's interesting. She is a godly woman. You'll see here. And Jehoiada, the priest, for she was a sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah, this wicked queen, like Cruella de Vil is really what she's like. She's like merciless, wants to kill all these people. So that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Okay. Before I was a believer, there was a movie, I don't even, I just remember seeing some parts of it, like, or the, I know the idea, of it because it was based off of a book, The Man and I Met, maybe, there's like two sons, and then we've read The Prince and the Pauper, where they switch places, have you ever read that book? So there's this, there's some epic stories of how there's a king that's in hiding, or something, and in this case, he was one year old when she hid him, so you're like, how could you hide a person? Well, by the time someone's one year old, our 11-month-old, one of them, slept for 11 hours, and yet they're not crying all the time. So God, in his foreknowledge, knew that there would be a child of this age, and this woman, she's like, I need to protect him, steal him away, because they're being murdered. So she's the brother of Ahaz she's the sister of her brother Ahaziah, and she's like, I need to preserve the line of David. She's kind of the unsung hero here, Jehoshaphat. In the seventh year of Jehoiada, in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and he made a covenant with all the captains of hundreds. Azariah, the son of Jehoram, Ishmael, the son of Jehoram, Azariah, the son of Obed, Masiah, the son of Adiah, and Elishaphat, the son of Zechariah. And they went throughout Judah, and they gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah, and the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign, as the Lord has said to the sons of, da of, the sons of David. This is what sh you shall do. One third of you entering on the Sabbath, the priests and the Levites, shall be keeping watch over the doors. One third shall be at the king's house, one third at the gate of the fountain. All the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. But let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priests and those who are Levites who serve. They may go in, for they are holy. But all the people shall keep watch of the Lord. And the Levites shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand. So he's saying, basically, guys, just like the movies, there's a secret king no one knows about. Notice Ezra and the Holy Spirit do not acknowledge that there was ever a queen because Athaliah was unfettered for eight years, roughly seven or eight years. It never talks about her being laid to rest and how she ruled for eight years because they did not acknowledge her rule as a valid rule because she murdered everyone to be in power. And she wasn't of the line of David, she was of the line of Ahab. So looking at this, this man named Jehoiada, his wife was the one who stole away the baby. So Jehoiada and Jehoshaphat are protecting this young boy. He's six, seven years old at this point. And they gather all the generals, all the basically secret forces and all the Levites. And they say, basically, we need to guard the house. We need to guard the temple. We need to guard the gate. And you all need to have a sword in your hand. Be ready. He said, let no one come in that doesn't belong here. And the Levites shall surround the king on all sides. He's like, you guys are his bodyguard. You're the secret service. He's the true king. So the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada, the priest, commanded. And each man took his men who were, with, uh, who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada, the priest, had not dismissed the division. So if you recall, 
the priests would come in, they'd work there a couple weeks, and then they would leave. I've got Joey and Tyler here that they come in and they play music every single week. Right? Got my brother, he plays, you know, every couple weeks. I have my sons and they have shifts, right? In the temple times, they would come in and spend several weeks, like we read in Luke, and they would draw their lot and Zechariah, when he was burning incense, Gabriel showed up to him and said, your, your wife, Elizabeth's going to have a son. He was doing his allotment. He was doing his period of serving before the altar. Every Levite had a shift or a period of weeks. In this case, because the hidden king, who was only six or seven years old, was to be raised to power and they wanted to take care of the wicked queen, Athaliah, they didn't let the Levites go home because he was just building up, building up, building up protective uh, safeguards. Similar to how we have in the New Testament, we have deacons and elders, but really there is a sense of structure to the church of faithful men. He wanted as many faithful men around this future king to show the world and to show his own nation. This Athaliah woman, this wicked daughter of Jezebel and Ahab, she has no place. And she's overtaken by treasonous means, and we're going to, by force, all of her wicked uh, minions are not going to be able to stop what God has in store. So, Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and the large and small shields that had belonged to King David. Now imagine, you've been serving the army of Israel, and someone... You've been serving the army of the United States. Just imagine this. And somebody says, here's the original armor that belonged to George Washington. To the, the armies of 1776. You know, when our nation became, declared the freedom. Like, it'd be, this is, they would have said, we're getting the spears of David. Are you kidding me? Several hundred year old Weapons that had been stored away, yes, now is the time, and why? Because it's similar to our nation where we see our liberties being stripped from us. People are going back to the basics and what was this nation founded upon. They were looking at what was the nation of Israel before even the split during Ray of Owen's time. What was the nation of Israel all about? First Chronicles 17, David was promised, through your line, the Messiah will come. Now, he's visibly giving them weapons that belong to King David, saying now is the time to protect the throne of David. And what we need to say is, now is the time, not about our nation, I'm talking about spiritually, to protect the importance of the son of David, Jesus, and his throne in our life. And be vigilant. And be in battle. And, and we do those tangible things in our nation and in the times that we live in. We do vote. We do practice our civic duties. But here, they literally are deposing a wicked woman and putting forth a man on the throne. He said, here's some weapons. And by the way, these were King David's. If I was in those armies and I saw the shields and the spears and the swords and the things that they were giving me, I would be thrilled to be able to be alive during such a time as that. But right now, I'm thrilled because of the times we're living in and what we're seeing happen in our lives. But these men were honorable and Jehoiada, he gives them a job, and he gives them the tools and the weapons. What I will say is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God gives you a job, and he gives you the tools and the weapons, and he's standing watch with you. He fights with you, not against you, but for you. Then he set all the people, every man with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple. Once again, we are the temple of God. We are fighting this spiritual battle along by the altar and by the temple all around the king. So imagine the temple is kind of a rectangular shaped area and he's got basically a wall. And we had all these riots a couple years ago. Interestingly, you know that there are uh, 6,000 homeless people in Portland today. Remember Portland didn't want to be governed by police. They wouldn't shut down everything. And now there's 6,000 homeless people stuck there. But I say that because there will be lines of police. Remember all the weapons and the men, and they'd be fighting and throwing things and Molotov you know, cocktails. And we see so they, they set up a barricade on every side of the temple. And they brought out the king's son. Now notice, you can imagine the temple surrounded by all these guards with weapons, with shields, with spears, 
And they put the crown on him and they gave him, what? The testimony. They gave him the word of God. And they and that was, well, you remember when Moses said, when you have a king or when it's instituted, that they are to read the law. They are to read the Torah. They gave him, some of you have your Bibles in your hands right now. They gave him what you're holding in your hands. And they made him king. Then Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, long live the king. Imagine, I don't think they just said it once. I bet it was many times. Long live the king. Long live the king. And if you've been in Jerusalem and you look around, you can hear for months, like, it's just miles. You can hear the Muslim call out the, like, you can hear the, it's kind of a depressing sound. You can hear the buses travel. You can hear, if there's a big bang, you can hear the beep, 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 because there's construction everywhere. When they said, long live the king, that reverberated all over this whole Temple Mount area, which is still there to this day. And you could see the, the men. And what happens here? Verse 12. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, because people would rush to the temple now and say, yes, our king. If you've ever seen the Orthodox Jews when they go up to the Wailing Wall, man, they pack it in, right? So many thousands of people in this small, small area. Imagine when the temple now was this big open area. There were probably, it was like a, a NFL game almost. You probably had 60,000 people just running and clamoring to be close to the new king, right? Even today when Queen Elizabeth's chariot and, or her caskets being carried, how many thousands of people waited for hours? When she looked, there was a king standing by his, his pillar at the entrance and the leaders and the trumpeters we're by the king, so you can imagine like playing the royal trumpets, dun, 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 whatever they're playing. They're playing this, and he's in all the fanfare, all the, the pomp and circumstance. And those who led in praise, you've got singers. This is a huge event. And so Athaliah, what does she do? In her self-righteous, unrighteous indignation, she tears her garments, her clothes, and she yells, Treason! Treason! Like the wicked witch that she is, right? Who was the treasonous one? Her, right? She's the one who murdered. She's the one who did not deserve to be in power. And Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were sent over the army, and he said to them, Take her outside under guard and slay her with a sword, whoever follows her. So if there's anybody who's brave enough to say that they're loyal to her, he said, Kill them all, basically. For the priest has said, do not kill her in the house of the Lord. She's so filthy, we don't even want to kill her here. Get her out of town. So they seized her, and she went by the way of the entrance of the horse gate into the king's house, and they killed her there. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between himself, the people, and the king, and that they should be the Lord's people. Now Jehoiada is the high priest. If you remember, the high priest is, is for life. And he's, he has sins, but he was the one during the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, that, or it was Rosh Hashanah, but Rosh Hashanah, he would make about 33 sacrifices, a bloody sacrifice once a year for the atonement of the people of Israel. He calls everyone around and he makes an agreement with them, made a covenant with them, the people, the king, that they should be the Lord's people. Like, hey, we all need to commit ourselves to the Lord. That's what got us into this trouble in the first place. And all the people went to the temple of Baal, and they tore it down. They broke down all of their idolatrous altars. They broke into pieces, pieces the altars, the images, and they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. So they took the high priest of the, the, the false gods, and they killed him. That sounds like what Elijah did with the prophets of Baal, right? With Ahab and Jezebel's false three or four hundred prophets, right? Also, Jehoiada appointed the oversight of the house of the Lord to the hand of the priests, the Levites, whom David had assigned in the house of the Lord to offer burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing, with singing, and it was established as it was established by David. So they're like, okay, we need to get these priestly orders, we need to get the music, we need to have things planned, and we need people to do their jobs, which is their honorable jobs, their privilege to serve the Lord. 
We need to follow David's instructions. And he set the gatekeepers at the gates at the, of the house of the Lord so that no one was able in any so that no one who was in any way unclean should enter. They set a guard so that no one who was an idolatrous uh, person or was bloody or um, impure could come into the temple. And he took the captains of hundreds, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land, and he brought the king down from the house of the Lord, and they went through the upper gate to the king's house and set the king upon the throne of the kingdom. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, for they had slain Athaliah with the sword. Remember, when the wicked rule, the righteous hide themselves. When the righteous rule, things are at peace and quiet. Next week we will read about how Joash repairs the temple. And one of the key things I wanted to mention is that Jehoiada, who was the high priest, was an influence on on this king. Um, and it, it is Ahaziah. But Jehoiada was in the influence for 130 years he lived. So think about that. David lived to a ripe old age, full life, at age 70. Jehoiada lived to be 130. And because he lived to be 130 years old, the people were blessed by that. And what was his whole call? It was to bring people back to the Lord. So here we have a picture of a, of a wicked king, Jehoram, who did not have a desire to serve the Lord, and he had ties to Ahab and Jezebel, and he was murderous. And then we have a young boy who didn't even know he had to have someone basically make the decisions for him from age six to whatever. And because he had a godly influence, people lived in peace for some 50, 60 years. What we'll hit on next week is that Joash made some repairs. He was seven years old when he became king. Now we're talking about Joah, Joash, not Ahaziah. Joash was led by King by Je uh, Jehoshaphat. Jehoiada, sorry. Joash, the seven-year-old king, Jehoiada, the high priest, and they were in tandem, really awesome. It's like Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. I'm just going to put that out there. Okay. When Andy Reid dies, or when Jehoiada, the priest, died, what happened to um, the king? Joash kind of went by the wayside. So let it not be so. And we're going to talk about that next time. We're going to talk about finishing strong. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Jehoiada. The priest, and for Jehoshabeth, the daughter of Ahaziah that rescued Joash. Lord, when there was wickedness and Athaliah, the wicked queen, murdering and, and worshiping idolatrous things, and Ahaziah building every wicked idol, idol um, altar and worshiping gods of pleasure and gods of money and gods of um, things we don't even want to repeat. Lord, you are the true God. And Lord, we thank you that you use Elijah to warn, but it grieves us that there was no call, there was no repentance, even though there was a call to repentance. And today, as we, we stand and we offer and we reach out to people and offer them that chance to be right with you, may we not be discouraged. May we be faithful like Jehoiada. And may we take those that are young pups that those that are small and young and don't know any better, and may we point them to being established in the ways of the Lord. Lord you never disappointed, you'll never fail, and you're on the throne. Lord, we thank you for that this morning. If there's anyone who hears this message and says, I don't trust in the Lord, may they look to you no further than to look to you. Who, you're on the throne, you're sovereign, you, the Father, the Creator that does not change. May they cry out to you and say, Father, I do believe that you sent Jesus, the son of David, to die on the cross for my sins, that I may be forgiven and that I may have eternal life. Please be my Lord and my Savior, Jesus, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we rejoice with those who make that decision. And we as your believers, we pray that you would help us to finish strong.
to be the Jehoiadas, to be the Jehoshabeths who stand in the face of evil and do what is right. In Jesus' name.